if we talk culture here for a minute, you know, culture is a word that's thrown around a lot. And uh, for yourself, obviously at Eastern Commerce, at Ryerson here at Canada Basketball, you've been a part of building a lot of highly successful cultures. So, you know, can you put your finger on what goes into the mix of truly building a, a winning culture? Well, yeah, I think this is something that I've become better at because I think it's it's very intentional. I think the hard thing about culture is that, you know, we often talk about cultures and building cultures, but we don't understand how to do that um, because we don't understand that it can be very intentional. And, you know, I, I think cult, great cultures are, are, you know, they have synergy with, with your values and your purpose and all of those things. Those are the starting points of building great cultures. But you know, in culture purely in itself is is behaviors. Uh, they are very definable. You can evaluate your culture. Uh, you know, I think if when you talk about do you have a successful culture, you know, how do you measure it? Can you evaluate it? How do you know if it's str- if it's successful or not? And I think all strong cultures have very um, definable, measurable behaviors, and those are the foundations of good culture. So, you know, if your culture, you know, if touch is a big part of your culture, then you know, can you measure that? Can you stat that? Um, so, you know, that's just one example. There's a ton of different things that we do and, and we've done it at all levels in the national team program at the senior level, at the junior level, and my teams at Ryerson, my high school teams. I've always been very, very intentional about how to go about building a culture. And then at this stage in my career, I think it's about measuring that and being able to to evaluate whether you're being successful in building it. And it's a daily fight. It's a daily grind. It's, it's something that you're always challenging your players on. And then, you know, great. Finally, I'd probably say this is that once you get there, those behaviors are often, um, you know, they're, they're really player led, you know, it's when the players are driving your culture that, you know, you're in a really, really good place. hundred uh, percent. Very well said. And of course for yourself looking around, you know, professional sport, elite sport, collegiate sport. Are there certain uh, cultures that um, you know inspire you to to continue to to build that? Well, I mean, certainly the San Antonio Spurs are probably the uh, you know the gold standard for me in basketball. Um, you know, the the foundation of how they've built uh, their family like environment and, and all the success that they've they've had, the, the way they've been able to match the character of the athlete that they're looking for to drive that culture and a guy like Tim Duncan, you know, the way they've drafted players who fit into their culture, you know, a great example for me is, you know, the, the, the San Antonio, um, you know, very deliberate strategy of using food as a driver of culture. You know, you always hear about their team meals and, and them eating as a group and, you know, after a devastating loss, they'll go out as a group and have a dinner and, and be able to talk and share and cry and laugh and all those things. And, and that just that behavior, that that action of having that meal is such a huge piece. And, you know, sometimes they're very simple things that we don't think about. Sometimes they're a little bit more complex. You know, they also have this, uh, you know, pound the rock philosophy that's now spread across the league and what that represents for their players and what that represents for their organization. And, They've been very intentional building it. And so certainly the Spurs have been a real uh, inspiration for me and, and also an organization that I've studied pretty heavily in depth. Yeah, that the idea of um, small things and things like meals and being able to connect in those ways is definitely something that um, brings people together in all walks of life. And, you know, for yourself coaching over a few different generations here, and as, as uh, we get more into social media and players are leaning on their phones more and, and things seem to change a little bit around around meals and gathering. Could you touch on a little bit of how you feel that things have changed maybe or how you need to communicate perhaps differently with athletes from maybe today's generation to a generation ago? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, obviously the distractions are far more prevalent now. There's a lot more competition for people's time. Um, you know, and... and um, but, but I think it's – I'm not sure it's changed tremendously in the fact that if you want to be effective, um, then having you know verbal voice-to-voice conversation is the key. I think it's pretty simple. I think the challenge becomes it's become a lot easier for us to neglect that because we can just send a text or send a message on social media and uh, we can – much more, you know, we can easily make an excuse that, you know, players and people aren't available because they're distracted or their attention spans aren't as, 
focused. But you know, what I found is that, you know, if you're willing to overcome that and, and it's hard because it's work and it's time and, and we ourselves are a lot more strapped for time. We have a lot more things going on. We're a lot more distracted, but if we can kind of eliminate those distractions and just key in on having those individual conversations, voice to voice, person to person, I think that is a, just a tremendous opportunity to build healthy culture and connection and uh, in a lot of communities now in, in sport and outside of sport, that's become a lost art the, you know, the art of having the great conversation is, um, it's a challenging one. You know, it's maybe that's why the reason, maybe it's a reason why podcasts have become so big and so interesting because we get a chance to actually listen to some great conversations because, uh, those are just, they're, they're, they're a lot harder to find and they're a lot harder to create because of, you know, many of the things that you spoke about. Yeah, it's, uh, pretty insightful that idea that there's there's more distractions but when it comes down to it those those conversations one-to-one are just as powerful today as they were in in other generations for sure and if we you know dovetail this into talking about team building you know if folks who aren't so familiar with basketball might not realize that FIBA recently changed their qualification system for the world cup leading to multiple qualification windows so you know for us at Canada Basketball, obviously having access to a lot of different players depending on the windows, which ultimately leads to a roster of, you know, 30 plus players coming into and out of the lineup. So, you know, coach for yourself and coaching that team, what's that like to try to build a cohesive team in a short time frame and oftentimes with different players coming in and out? It's exhausting. Uh, it's taxing because it, it kind of leads it to what we just talked about previously, right? I mean, there is a lot of conversation that has to happen in a very short period of time. And much of that very direct and very intentional. Um, and as a coach, I have to lead that. And it's not just our players, but it's our staff and it's the support staff. And, you know, you try to touch everyone as much as you can. You know, Hubie Brown had a great saying, said, you know, 30 seconds for every player every day. And Sometimes in, in coaching and sometimes in, in life, I mean, in whatever business we're in, that can be a challenge. And, you know, just to be intentional in that way in such a small uh, snippet of time and say, I'm going to make that time for every person every single day can be a challenge. Now, you know, scale that up in a, in a short prep time when you're going into a major competition and you have, you know, maybe three days to prepare and you have 20 people in your group and uh, it, it's a lot of energy. And sometimes you have to make some choices and um, for me, the choices have always been connection first, tactics and strategy second. And uh, I try to be as intentional as I can in that way to make sure that there's a healthy connection because, you know, trusting and uh, trusting teams and teams that are connected are far more successful than teams that have a great, you know, tactical plan, in my opinion. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, in that qualification period, you know, you mentioned kind of building sort of those bonds first and connecting with people first. And of course we had some pretty arduous travel to get to the first game in Venezuela. Um, the result wasn't um, ideal. Obviously there was a loss there, which put a bit more pressure on the subsequent game in Brazil. You know, how do you, how do you bounce back from that in such a short time frame, knowing, um, you know, the guys are tired, guys haven't slept, tough loss. And now you got to come back and, and, and get everybody on the same page and really bring that hundred percent effort for that uh, subsequent game. Yeah, I think there's, there's a few things there. I mean, one is just, uh, you know, I, I've become far more, uh, interested and also invested in load management and, you know, obviously, you know, the team that we have at Canada basketball, I think from a sports science perspective is one of the best in the world. I mean, and you're part of that team. And so, you know, I, I've had a real curiosity to learn as much as I can about what we're doing on that side and then, and then trust it and uh, really, you know, follow, you know, and, and have, you know, really, really in-depth, uh, meaningful conversations with Sam Gibbs, who, you know, obviously uh, runs our, runs that whole side of things for us and, you know, collectively decide how we're going to manage load and then. You know, really, again, coming back after that Venezuela loss was having an honest conversation. And, and I didn't feel that it was, you know, I kind of thought we did all right. I, you know, we lost by eight, uh, which set us up nicely for the return leg at home when Venezuela was going to come play us. But all things considering, you know, a 26-hour travel, we arrived uh, in Caracas and checked into our hotel rooms at 7.30 a.m. and played at 6.15 that, that night. Unbelievable. Right. You know, we had no practice. We had no shoot. We just decided that we were going to watch film and then head to the arena and play the game. And I was fine with that because I, my biggest thing was I wanted them to be rested and as fresh as we could. Um, 
And we talked about it as a group afterwards, and, and I put it in perspective. I said, hey, you know what? Tough loss. You know, shots didn't go down. We were a little sloppy. We are, and we turned it over, but all things considering, um, you know, uh, our, our qualification wasn't a one-game process. It was, you know, we had three more games to go after Venezuela, and we put it in perspective and got on the plane at 2 a.m. that night and had another grueling day of travel and uh, started to get ready for Brazil. So, you know, I, I think a lot of it is just having a measured approach trusting your team, and really being honest in your messaging.